Emma Perez is a research social scientist at the Southwest Center of the University of Arizona um, and a professor in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. Her first novel, Gulf Dreams, is one of the first Chicanx queer lesbian novels. Her second novel, Forgetting the Alamo or Blood Memory, won the Isherwood Writing Grant and the National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies Book Award for Fiction. Emma has also published numerous essays in the history monograph, The Decolonial Imaginary, Writing Chicanas into History. Emma, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm gonna read from uh, Forgetting the Alamo or Blood Memory, which is the one that um, I'm pretty fond of because it's an historical novel and I did a, a, and I'm an historian. I'm a trained historian and, and so, and I'm from Texas. So it, all of that is, is in the novel. So I'm just gonna read a few, um, the opening scenes, and then I'm gonna read uh, just a page and a half from the novel I'm working on right now, which is a dystopian novel. Um, so here we go, forgetting the Alamo. Everyone said he was lucky, but I didn't believe it, not for a second. Jedediah Jones wasn't lucky. The angels of clemency had forsaken him, but the devil, the dim-witted devil of injudicious earthly things whispered in his ear that he was a good boy and Jed confused the imp on his shoulder for an angel. My cousin, half white, half Mexican and full fool was lucky at cards, that's all, just lucky at cards. And tonight was no different. He leaned back in his chair, tilting the legs the same way he would tilt his hat back on his head until it seemed it would fall, but it didn't. He leaned back and smiled big the way only he could, whether he had a bad hand or a good hand. He loved the game and so did I, but he thought he was better player since he was so good at pretending to be good. And even when I tried to do as he did, I went unnoticed while he went home with all the winnings. The year was 1836. Battles were behind us and more were before us and many spoke of a war that would change our lives, but none of that mattered to my cousin. Jedediah Jones sloped his long, tapered chest into the table, peeked at his hand, and winked at me across from him. Another card from the dealer caused him to slant his hat farther back on his head. I recognized that tip off. He was about to win big or lose big. Either way, all eyes were on my cousin because he had a way that obliged you to watch him. I was the plain opposite. No one watched me and at the same time, I might have taken advantage of my unexceptional character more than I had known more had I known that I could have used it to my gain, but I lacked confidence and envied what I didn't have, and that was Jed's style for winning, even when he was losing. Me, I was impatient for victory, the kind of impatience that makes you look nervous to others, especially since I didn't know how to risk all that had to be risked if I was to be the victor. I fidgeted, twirling strands of my hair. I bit my nails, but I never threw myself wholly into the game. I was young and scared, but too stupid to know I was scared. So instead I feigned a self-possession that carried me through my young life like the lie that it was. I think back to that infamous day for no other reason than missing Jedediah Jones. I asked myself plenty why I bother yearning for my conceited cousin, but when I imagined his white teeth glinting from that idiot grin, I pined for him more. Nearly a decade has passed since our many battles with each other, and I still get mad at myself for the way I feel. Of course, the years have taught me some things, but of what I am not yet sure. The game started out easy with my father, Je Jed, and me playing to pass the time. None of us wanted to get back to the ranch so early on a Saturday afternoon. I guess Jed won enough times off of my father to get to feeling confident so that when three ugly strangers entered the saloon in our small town of El Pueblo, Jedediah Jones swaggered from the, back, from the bar back to our table, waving to the newcomers to come play. I gawked at each one, memorizing their vile faces without knowing that's what I was doing at the time. The leader of the bunch had a short stub of a nose with scabs falling off, looking like his stout had only recently been chopped off. As a stranger sat down, the stub-nosed leader elbowed another man equally as ugly with an ear half gone as if someone had cut it but neglected to cut clear through. The third of the trio was a craggy with a craggy face and yellow teeth, wasn't as homely, and I hardly noticed him since he put down his cards and folded for the first game. Stub nose and half ear winked at each other for a moment, and I thought they were cheating. I'm out, it was half ear. Hell, you give up too easy, runner. I ain't lucky like you, Rove. I ain't lucky, just sure of myself. 
The stubborn-nosed man named Rove looked at Jedediah, wheezing hard. I'm going to go all, all in, in with this one, son. You want to stay in? Jed squinted his already beady eyes and pushed his hat farther and farther back and chuckled out loud. Do what you want, old man. I'm ready for you. I, go, I got a horse outside, says you're bluffing. How about that, a horse? You bet me a horse? Jed grinned, fine, a horse for a horse. I'm all in myself, I said, but I might as well have not spoken. I got a horse outside myself. This time I whispered since I was lying. I had no horse and neither did Jed, but somehow his, his lies were more convincing than mine. You're bluffing. Jed singled out a piece of straw from his shirt pocket and chewed. Well, how about I show you mine or you show me yours? Rove winked at Jed. How about you go first, old man? Ain't you a gentleman? Somebody sure taught you some good manners, son. Rove laid his cards down and showed three kings. How do you like that? Jedediah Jones fanned out five cards. He was showing three aces. The stub-nosed man got up at high speed and I cringed until I saw him retrieve a leather pouch from the back of his pocket and slam it on the table. Take it, it's all I got, but damn it, son, don't take my horse. I need my horse. You a patriot, ain't you? That depends. On what? Oh, on who I'm being a patriot for. General Sam Houston, that's who. I can't go into battle for the general holding nothing but my dick. I need my horse, son. He sat back down and fingered his six-shooter, pointing the barrel at my cousin. I felt myself go red, but my dark skin's color hid my flushed cheeks, and my long, girly, crimped hair fell forward, hiding my face. Okay, that's the opening scene. And if you'll bear with me, just listen to the first page or two of this dystopian novel, which I hope to finish during these dystopian times. Um, and it's called I Ben Espinosa. So it's kind of set up like a testimonio. And the, the date begins with July 5th, 2059. My name is Benito Espinosa, but you may call me Ben. In this cave, inside these cages, our prison since last November's counterfeit election, we're all brown ones. That detail demands thought. Make a note. Scribble it on your palm or tap it into your electronic notepad. Above ground, the surveyors, as we sometimes call them, observe us through microscopic glasses as if we're guinea pigs, but we're not that remarkable to those above who see us as waste, refuse to recycle, use up and dump into unseen, uninhabitable spaces. I, Ben Espinosa, reluctant captive, must find a way out of this dungeon, but you must understand, even the most dire of days can't motivate me. Of course, there came that one ominous day when motivation moved me into the forefront of that which I could never have foreseen, but that day brought us here to this prison. There at the center of our caged courtyard in which we are filed for 10 minutes of daily sun stands my dark-eyed Tamaya. I don't have my wife's enigmatic chocolate eyes. Mine vary from burnt sienna to pale sepia bending to gray governed by the sun's light. You could even say that my eye color shifts, but in this dismal lockup, I'm self-assuredly brown like everyone, including Tamaya. When I met her, she conquered every nerve on my flesh, every cell inside my skin. I was an old man by most social standards, but that she looked my way made me a lucky old man. Confusion about me stems from my having inhabited a man's body for convenience and political maneuverings, which is to say I was an opportunist, unaware and privileged, and the opportunities bestowed upon me for no other reason than my male sex. We are in a century when everything and nothing has changed. Sex shifting commonly transpires as a consequence of the era, whether hidden, repressed, or visible for all to see. You must understand I'm not to blame for my shallow opportunism. This is who I am in this policed place. I have no control. My contemplative mind has been hijacked. I have no will. I only felt a kind of willingness, a passion I had denied until I met Tamaya. And now in this global order, all has been dictated and we must succumb to the dictators. In my mind, I'm still Ben Espinosa, but Tamaya reminds me that time has passed, Alejandra. You're no longer that heretical male. But I remind her that heterodoxy brought her to me or I to her. And so that's it. Bravo. Thank you, everyone. Terrific. Can't wait to read that dystopian novel. I can't wait to finish it. So how, how far along are you, by the way? I, I'm about, it's going to be short. It's only going to be about 120, 130 pages. But I've, 
I've already got 120 actually, so it's probably gonna be about 20 or 30 more. I'm on the last section, very, very Perfect. last. And then yeah. I just revised. I mean, I don't know in these, as you call them dystopian times, I've actually been remarkably productive. <laughs> you know, you know what, me too. I think it works for introverts who are writers. Right. I think yeah. it does, and I feel guilty about that. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have felt very guilty that I'm actually relishing this time. Um, but, you know, yeah. it's happening out there. Yeah, I think all of us really have been practicing social distancing for decades, I think. So it's, it's natural to us. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, everyone, for listening. So next up, Andrew Sansom is the author of eight books, including Water in Texas, an introduction, and series editor of 23 books on Texas and the environment. He is former executive director of both Texas Parks and Wildlife and Texas Nature Conservancy, and founder of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment at Texas State. His published works have appeared in Texas Monthly, the Texas Observer, Politics Today, Texas Highways, and the Texas Parks and Wildlife. Please welcome Andy Sensom. Thank you, Sergio. Thank all of you. Uh, this is uh, really, I feel very, very undeserving of being in this company, but I'm very honored. And I would also like to say that one of the things that has really made me feel good is how kind everyone has been, starting with you and Carmen and my spirit animal, Steve Davis. So I'm going to read uh, from three of my books, short passages. The first was a book that um, I wrote in conjunction with a first responder that flew Galveston and the upper Texas coast immediately after Hurricane Ike. Where I grew up on the upper coast, hurricanes were as much a part of our lives as mosquitoes, migrating birds, oysters, and petrochemical plants. They came and went nearly every year and were in some ways just an, uh, another aspect of our existence, enduring contributors to our sense of place. The really big ones became chronological terms of reference that we use to date family events and other occasions. Hurricane Carla, for example, which struck us in 1961, which for many years was simply referred to as the storm and weddings, funerals, graduations, and other significant family events were positioned in time by a relationship to its landfall. We remember John F. Kennedy's famous address to Congress in May of 61, promising to put a man on the moon as occurring in the year of the storm. I lived on the coast during one of two major periods of hurricane activity in the Gulf, between 1960 and 1980. 10 very large hurricanes made landfall on the coast. The first cycle was from 1900 to 1920, when 11 major storms came ashore. Today, three of the nation's largest metropolitan areas lie on the Gulf Coast, Tampa, New Orleans, and Houston. It's estimated that there's more than 500 billion in insured property built between Texas and the Florida Panhandle. And though the losses thus far have been enormous, we continue to encourage and subsidize even more development squarely in the path of these great natural behemoths. The beach is quiet after a hurricane. And as I walked along the coast after Ike, I thought of Ozymandias, whose history Shelley captured nearly 200 years ago in just 14 lines along with that of the civilization he ruled in the timeless hubris of humanity. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level stands stretch far away. Walking on the beach in solitude amid the wreckage after a hurricane brings a sense of loss, of survival, of one's own insignificance, and of life beginning again. There's renewal in the marshes, estuaries, and other natural systems along the coast, 
that comes from having been thoroughly flushed by wind and water, not unlike the cleansing power of wildfire on upland prairie. In the aftermath of such trauma, both humanity and nature somehow rebound, undeterred by the reality that there will be more storms to come. Several years ago, I had the privilege of writing a series of essays to accompany a group of paintings of Texas rivers with a wonderful gallery owner in Houston whose name was William Rees. The book was called Of Texas Rivers and Texas Art. I'll always remember the night that we camped on a sandbar in Santa Elena Canyon. The sheer 1,500 foot walls on both sides of the river that Americans called the Rio Grande, in Mexico it's the Rio Bravo, rendered our view of the sky a narrow winding ribbon of blue far above. At twilight, a peregrine falcon swooped down and snatched a quick flitting Mexican free tail bat right out of the air. After the dinner, dishes were washed and put away and the ribbon over our heads deepened to a rich indigo, now spangled with a million stars. Pleasantly tired, we savored the afternoon's run. The river flowing through the canyon was challenging, but presented no serious danger to us in our canoes. In the campfire's glow, we looked ahead with anticipation to the day to come. The strong currents of this great river would take us through the imposing formation known as a rock slide and ultimately out of Santa Elena and into the scorching sun of the Chihuahuan Desert. As we sat comfortably by our campfire, thinking about tomorrow's float, we never dreamed that the day might come when there would not be enough water in the Rio Grande for such an adventure to be possible. I returned to Santa Elena a while back and there was so little water flowing that we had to put in at the mouth, which is normally the end of the trip and paddle upstream to the rock pile in the still pool of water is all that remains of the river there. The canyon is still magnificent and though we were again humbled to be back beneath the lovely ribbon of sky, the flowing river is gone and somehow the Great Canyon has lost its soul. My most recent book is about a ranch in the hill country that was inspired by the author Lewis Bromfield, who was an early 20th century novelist who restored a played out farm in Ohio called Malabar, Malabar Farm and wrote a book about it called Pleasant Valley. His acolyte was the chairman of Church's Fried Chicken, whose name was David Bamberger. And inspired by Bromfield, he established a ranch in Blanco County, which he called Sela. We stood in the twilight on a hillside at Sela, the fabled ranch in Blanco County owned by J. David Bamberger. The word Sela is Hebrew, meaning stop, pause, and reflect. And a gathering of J. David's friends had come together in the Texas Hill Country to celebrate the launch of a new research and education center named for his late wife, Margaret. We listened to the sounds of the lovely spring evening and to Colleen Gardner, executive director of Bamberger Ranch Preserve, the nonprofit formed in 2002 to support the conservation work and educational mission at CELA. Using a familiar but compelling metaphor, she described their work at the ranch as being akin to the building of the world's great cathedrals. The builders of the grand cathedrals of Europe knew when they started that they would never see the fruits of their labor. Completion of these magnificent structures would not come for hundreds of years, well beyond the lifetimes of their children and even their grandchildren. The cathedral builders including stonemasons, blacksmiths, carpenters, and more, understood that the inspiration ultimately provided by their labor was not a byproduct of that labor, but rather its essential purpose. Thus, said Colleen, 
as the deepening shadows of our spring evening at Sela enveloped us, the cathedral builders understood that not only would they not live to see the completion of their work, but also that their work was inspired by that understanding. Thank you. Thank you, that was terrific, Andy. Um, Andy, I have a question. Have you ever written environmental fiction? No, I've thought about it. Uh, your spirit animal recommended one of my favorite books, um, The Overstory by Richard oh, Power. Yeah. yeah. Which I loved. It's a wonderful book. Oh, just completely blew my mind and opened. You know, my son, as I, I'm dying for my son to get to know you because he's an environmentalist at Yale uh, studying environmental law. So um, I'm sending Aaron. him. Aaron, exactly. Yes, I, I would I just, really like to meet him. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a great kid. Just He's just finished his first year of law school. so, And he's doing forestry school and law school at the same time. But, uh, but I, I love hearing your work. We're going to be so thrilled to have him in our movement. Yeah. Well, he's a, he's a committed soul. You know. So thank you. Thank you very much. So next up, born in Lima, Peru, and raised in Florida, in the Rio Grande Valley, Natalia Sylvester is the author of Chasing the Sun, which was named Best Debut Book of 2014 by Latinidad. Her second novel, Everybody Knows You Go Home, won the 2019 Jesse H. Jones Award for Best Book of Fiction from the TIL. Her third book, a debut YA novel forthcoming from Clarion Books in about a month or so. Um, has already been named the Junior Library Guild selection. So welcome, Natalia. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you all so much. Um, it's a real honor to me to be um, welcomed into TIL. And so I, and, and I know that we weren't able to gather last month, but I really appreciate the efforts you put into creating this so that we could all gather virtually. So thank you. Um, so I thought I would read the opening of my most recent novel, well, my uh, Everyone Knows You Go Home, and then I would read the opening of my upcoming novel, Running. Um, and I'm excited for Running because it's my debut YA, and my previous two books were adult books, but um, each one is just very close to my heart in just very different ways. So uh, I'll start with Everyone Knows You Go Home. Uh, Chapter one, November 12th, to the, sorry. Chapter one, November 2nd, 2012, the big day. They were married on the day of the dead, el día de los muertos, which no one gave much thought to in all the months of planning until the bride's deceased father-in-law showed up in the car following the ceremony. He manifested behind the wheel, then stretched his arm over the back of the passenger seat as he turned to face Martin and Isabel. Beautiful ceremony, mijo, he said. The couple's smiles froze. It seemed to take an eternity for either of them to speak, and when they did, they had little more than mumbles. Her whole life, Isabel had heard stories about spirits who spent this one day of the year with family. As a child, she had built altars for her great-grandparents, vibrant tributes made out of open shoeboxes adorned with paper flowers and pictures of religious figures that looked a lot like the dioramas she'd created in grade school. In her teens, her family congregated around her great aunt's grave to clean it. One year, her mother even brought a battery operated vacuum for the stone. Today we remember our dead, her mother always said. We honor them. Martin's father looked more frazzled than dead, as if he was running late because he had been caught in traffic. Isabel looked to her new husband for guidance and was shocked to realize he seemed annoyed. Not afraid, because honestly, her father-in-law looked harmless, just like in the few pictures she had seen of him. No, Martin looked like he had simply bitten into a pepper that was hotter than anticipated. Did you know this would happen, she said. No, but it's typical of him, typical. Only someone so shameless would show up to a wedding uninvited. Martin, please. She hadn't expected him to be so rude. She hadn't expected any of this at all but her instincts to remain polite and respect her elders were deeply ingrained, even more than her assumptions about life and death, apparently. And so her efforts to understand the situation were quickly overridden by her desire to make everybody feel comfortable. 
It was the first time she had met her father-in-law. She smoothed her white dress, which was bulging into every inch of the seat, and straightened her veil over her shoulders. Aren't you going to introduce us? The old man sat quietly, waiting. I'm not talking to him, Martin said. Martin, you can't be serious. At this, her father-in-law smiled and leaned toward her through the small space that separated the front and back of the white Rolls Royce they had rented. Oh, he is, I promise you. That kind of stubbornness runs deep in our blood. Isabel, I'm Omar, so I hope they've at least told you my name. Of course, she said, encantada. So that's the opening of Everyone Knows You Go Home. Um, and um, this is running, so this, um, Everyone Knows You Go Home actually takes place in the Valley in McAllen. Um, running takes place in Miami, and it's about a 15-year-old girl whose father is running for president. So this is the opening chapter of Friends. There's a lot of pages. Okay. Gloria collects the mangoes from the tree in our backyard once they've fallen, but before the birds or the bugs can get to them. She cuts them into cubes and lets me nibble on the pepa, and then she packs them into my lunch in a little Tupperware with a spoon. When I get home from school, the first thing she always asks is, did you remember to bring back my tapir? Then she washes the container by hand and leaves it to dry face down on the counter. In the mornings, I help her pack me and my brother's lunches while I wait for my mom and dad to get dressed. I cut out sandwiches into triangles and put them in Ziplocs. I put the cold cuts back in the fridge and wipe the counter. Somehow, Gloria always sneaks in a note on my napkin. I know I'm too old for them, but they're funny, usually some pun having to do with food. Like with the mangoes, she'll write, man, go eat some fruit. She always spells fruit like that, without the I. She's learning and she's trying, but it's the words that are similar in English and Spanish that trip her up. She even has a language app on her phone that she plays in the kitchen while she cooks, but only if my parents aren't home yet. It makes her say things like, the mountain is too far to walk, which cracks me up because there's not a single mountain in Miami. Not unless you count Mount Trashmore, the landfill we pass on the highway anytime we go to Orlando. The morning after Bobby dropped his bombshell of a plan on our futures, the papaya tree in our neighbor's yard had yielded, fruit, had yielded fruits the size of footballs. It growed in an angle so that one of the fruits dangled over our side of the fence. Gloria ran across the grass to get it before the neighbors could see her. That day at lunch, along with a Tupperware full of diced papaya, I got a napkin that read, Papa ya agradeció a los vecinos. It's a play on words, so it loses all its humor in English. Dad already thanked the neighbors. Which is what I said to Zoe, who speaks so little Spanish the joke was entirely lost on her. Papa and ya mean dad already, I explained. Gloria just likes to make double meanings with different words for food. It's not that funny if you have to explain it, Zoe said. Vivi and I locked eyes and smirked <clears throat> when she wasn't looking, a silent acknowledgement that we, of course, had gotten it. Even though she teases me about the notes being childish, she also thinks they're cute in a charming retro kind of way. I told her about the stolen fruit <clears throat> and the mango tree that's ours and how Gloria jokes there's so many mangoes we should sell them off the side of the road. Vivi only laughed and said, oh my God, Maddie, that's so roughy. Bobby got home late that night, so we waited for him to eat because he kept calling to say he'd just, be, he'd just left the office. He was just five minutes away. He was just eight minutes away. When he arrived 25 minutes later, I got so upset watching him take off his tie and unbutton his shirt at the table that I blurted out, oh my God, Bobby, that's so roughy. He stopped and gestured to me with his right hand, balled up in a loose fist, his thumb sticking out. Mariana, we do not talk like that in this family. What would people say? People. He's always saying that, like there's some invisible audience watching us at all times. Why not? What does that mean? My brother asked. Ricky's seven years younger than me, but his question made me realize that I didn't know what that word meant either. Not really. Mommy cleared her throat and wiped her mouth with a napkin on her lap. This is her not so subtle way of warning my father to be careful. I've gotten this look so many times, it might as well be a neon, neon light flashing cuidado across her forehead. It's, it's a horrible thing to say about people who've been through difficult times. 
It's short for refugee, Poppy added harshly, and very insensitive. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know. You know better than to be so careless with your words, he said. That could be your grandparents, Nami added. They fled Cuba not even a week after they were married, leaving everything. My dad set his hand on the table, rattling our silverware, the salt and pepper shakers. We don't make fun of people like them. When Bobby says people, there's a hierarchy. First, it's his campaign manager, then his biggest donors, then the news anchors and Twitter and Facebook and basically the entire internet. People we can't see, but who can see us. People I'm devoting my life to, he always says. That's why my father is running for president, to make things better for everyone. Except, it turns out, me. Thank you. Bravo. I have to tell you, Natalia, I'm a big fan of everybody knows you go home. Thank you. Uh, just, I mean, the plot twists are great, keep you entertained, but what I thought you did excellently in that book was the subtlety of your characterizations. Just really well done. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to tell you that because I, I love that book. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. So last, uh, but certainly not least, Dan Williams is the author of eight books, including Past Purgatory, A Distant Paradise, which won the 2019 Philosophical Society of Texas's Award for Best Book of Poetry. His most recent book is You Can't Build a Company, The Life and Principles of Marlene and Spencer Hayes. Dan is director of TCU Press and the Honors Professor of Humanities in the John B. Roach Honors College at Texas Christian University. Dan, it's all yours. You have to unmute yourself. You're still muted. You have to press the... Got it. There you go. Uh, well, thank you. And thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, it is a great honor to be here, uh, one I'm deeply grateful for. It's also uh, a little in intimidating. Uh, I'm going to read a, a couple short poems, and uh, two of the poets I admire the most are here tonight, Jim and Lynn Hoggard, and uh, they've been great inspirations for me. Uh, I hope I will not offend them by anything I read. Um, for most of my life, uh, professional life, I masqueraded as a uh, literary historian. And uh, one of the things that I always loved about my work was uh, the richness of, of past rhetoric. And so I often started as a closet poet playing around with some of the rhetoric I encountered and uh, a lot of the, the poems are based on historical figures or uh, historical texts that I have uh, reused. This first one is a uh, found poem, uh, word for word, from a, uh, excuse me, 15th century monk named Fra Filippo de Strata who was inflamed about uh, a new invention of the time called the printing press. The title is, The Pen is a Virgin, The Printing Press a Whore, a Found Poem. They shamelessly print at negligible price material which may, alas, inflame impressionable youths, while a true writer dies of hunger, cure, if you will, the plague which is doing away with the laws of all decency and curb the printers. They persist in their sick vices, setting tibulus and type, while a young girl reads Ovid to learn sinfulness. Through printing, tender boys and gentle girls, chaste without foul stain, take in whatever mars purity of mind or body. They encourage wantonness and swallow up huge gain for it. This is what printing presses do. 
they corrupt susceptible hearts. The silly asses do not see this, and brutes rejoice in the fraudulent title of teachers, exalting themselves with song. For a small sum, men turn themselves into doctors in three years. Let thanks be rendered to the printers. No, the pen is a virgin, the printing press a whore. I don't think you can find better rhetoric than that. <clears throat> uh, the next one is on a uh, 16th century or yeah, 16th, late 16th century figure uh, who was burned at the stake. The title is Domenico Scandela, known as Menocchio. They burned him with books, Menocchio, his second inquisition, for speaking his mind, for failing to wear his heretic's uniform, the emblazoned red cross, for reading the Bible in vernacular, the apocryphal gospels, Boccaccio, Mandeville, and perhaps the Quran, burned him for creating a cosmos of cheese and worms, burned him at 67, the father of 11 children on orders of the Pope, for nagging his neighbors, for spouting impious beliefs, for speaking his mind, for arguing with priests, for denying the Holy Virgin was a virgin or holy, for believing Christ was a mortal man like us, for suffering religious delirium, for resenting the rich, the oppression, the oppressors of the poor, for rejecting sacraments, for confessing to trees, for believing the church was created by men to control men, for refusing the veneration of relics, for horrible and execrable excesses, for imagining putrefaction is creation. They burned him as an example to others, for refusing scripture, for exalting his neighbors more than God, for being a self-taught miller, a poor peasant who dared to speak his mind, and finally, for playing the guitar at carnivals. Uh, I spent a lot of time early reading early American criminal narratives, uh, especially different kinds of uh, confessions that were published. And this one is based on, uh, as the title suggests, the dying speech of Owen Sullivan executed on May 10, 1756 for counterfeiting. And Owen Sullivan uh, is a historical figure. And this is uh, uh, about 80% from the narrative and some words I threw in to play with. Sullivan the moneymaker confessed that he was unwilling to die, his dying speech a warning not to obey, but to burn and destroy all the plates and paper. Don't die on a tree as I do, he implored. And to the hangman, don't pull the rope so tight. It's hard for a man to die in cold blood. Then to all he smirked. I cannot help smiling, tis the nature of the beast. His dying speech taken from his mouth, the papers reported he died obstinate, but he lived obstinate, a runaway apprentice chased by devils, a soldier given to take the cup, a self-taught forger, he declared counterfeiting an easy way of making money. With four sets of accomplices and three colonies, he circulated 40,000 worth or more of notes and coin. Cropped, branded, and whipped, he cut, cut plates in jail and broke jail, and then turned himself in to save his friends. The night before his execution, someone cut down the gallows. Um, 
I, I hate long poems. I hate to read them and I certainly hate to write them. Uh, but I found myself in the midst of something that's going on five pages right now. And so this is a work in progress. I read a story of uh, uh, St. Juliana and then I started doing a little stupid research into uh, the cult of virgin martyrs. And uh, I started playing around with some of the rhetoric I found. It starts off though in the uh, 19th century uh, with a reference to uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Resurrected by a dumb bird squawking nevermore, the poet, perpetually plagued by the imp of the perverse, the pursuit of the inex inaccessible, proclaimed, the death of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world. Sanctifying insufferable suffering, these early church fathers, venerable patriarchs, found plenty of poetical subjects. Scores of holy virgin martyrs, innocence in agony, enduring dreadful moments of affliction. Beautiful young women, untouched and pure, tortured, disfigured, and murdered most horribly for embracing Christ, their lover. Their stories and bones venerated, ossified knuckles and toes consecrated, the worship of hallowed saints, relics, pain, and virginity. And then the rest of the poem is a series of uh, uh, little stories, what Jim Hoggard calls story poems. I didn't even know there was such a term until he told me that. Um, and I, I just want to read a couple short ones and then move on to something more wholesome, I hope. Having taken Christ as her lover, Juliana refused to marry Eleusius, the man her father chose, a proud pagan provost, giver of laws. Her father, Africanus, not knowing his daughter's secret baptism, her vow of perpetual chastity, her marriage to Christ, and hostile to all Christians, beat his daughter savagely, her defiance, then handed her over to Eleusius, her would-be husband, for prosecution. Irked at his rebuff, Eleusius ordered Juliana stretched between pillars and doused with molten metal. Still refusing to renounce, she was cast into prison and when tempted with evil, wrestled with the devil, the son of Beelzebub, and defeated him, yet he escaped reappearing at her trial, a surprise witness before the implacable provost who had his betrothed beheaded. I actually don't think I want to read any more of that. Uh, if, if you start looking up, even if you go, go to Google uh, or, or Wikipedia, you can find a list of about 60 some virgin martyrs who were canonized at one point and most later decanonized because they seem to be more fictional than historical. Um, I'll read two more. This is uh, titled Back in the 80s but some moments can never be forgotten. The store is long gone, but the memory remains, an old automotive and tire store that sold bits of everything. Located in a shabby strip mall where there was dry cleaning, barbecue, Chinese loans, real estate, insurance, and jewelry, everything reasonably priced. The old man stood next to the cash register, listening while a young clerk read out the payment agreement. A formidable form, $25 a month for forever for four tires installed in back. Stoop with the burden of years, of decades, living as a black man in the deep south, 
of living a life inescapable, a life restrained, a life defined by why, by infectious lies, by the strangest fruit. The old man nodded at each provision, more patient than we were, until the clerk handed him the form and a pen. Still nodding, he accepted, and with meticulous care marked his X, blue ink on yellow paper. Then straightening, he turned to us in line and spoke a whispery voice that echoes still. Sorry, y'all had to wait. And uh, this last poem makes an obvious reference I'm sure everybody will pick up from Emily Dickinson. But I try to turn it around. Winter's long and late to leave, and an afternoon's walk is covered in dusk and shadow. The sky's sullen, choked with gray-black clouds that portend tomorrow's storm. And sharp wind stings, limiting sight to ground, leash, and dog. Yet walking requires glancing. Three buzzards rise, circling then dark over the creek bed, its stink bank eroded. Through the woods, cantankerous jays squawk, and in a thicket, a squirrel pokes and digs through dead leaves, while a quick flash of cardinal startles. When land is framed in darkness, winter afternoons oppress, sealing despair as shadows lengthen. Yet ever there's a certain slant of light that breaks the cloud cover, Revealing a glint of gold in withered grass, a glimpse contracting forever, and ever dog pulls leash homeward. Even the dark spills light. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. So um, I wanted to thank everybody here for, for coming and um, and you can unmute yourselves if you want, and we can chat a little bit. I'll turn off the recording in a few seconds, but we have one of these left um, next in, in two weeks, and uh, that'll be our last readers. Uh, and it's, I hope it'll be a, a, a great uh, get together just like this one. And that's really been my point to do these, to have everyone hear the new voices of the TIL, the new members, to celebrate the new members, and, and also it's really simply to interact with each other since we're all separated in a way. Um, so thank you for coming and I, I certainly appreciate uh, all the, the work you did to, to get here. And, um, and we love having you as new members, by the way. So I'm gonna turn off the recording right now.